Jiayin Han, Scientific Editor at Cell. I'm here for the ADA's Cosmic Harbor Symposium. And today I'm joined with Dr. Dennis Dubell from University of Geneva. Hello, Jiayin. Yeah, hello. It's very great to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, so um, today's, I think, like this year's topic is genes at work. So when we talk about genes, I think it, your work at Hox Gene Loci has really made a tremendous contribution to the field to really understand embryonic development. And I was just a little bit curious, how, how do you start with thinking about this locus to begin with? Oh, it's, it's, it's funny you ask the question, because in fact the story started here in 1985. Okay. That was for the 50th anniversary of the Cosmic Harbor Symposium. Oh. And that was the real first meeting reporting all these great discoveries. That was the cloning of the hummingbirds, and uh -huh. there were uh, great uh, Drosophilis were there, like Ed Lewis and Yanni Nussline and Eric Bischhaus. And then there was the start of the real molecular developmental biology. And at that time, I was a postdoc in Pierre Chambon's lab in mm -hmm. Strasbourg. And I sent me to this meeting to see what was going on. And then I came back to Europe and that was full of energy and I decided to start in, in this field. And soon after, then we started to clone these genes in uh, mammals with mm -hmm. different laboratories, that of Peter Cruz and Eduardo Boncinelli. And then the story started. I see. So with all those years working in the Hox gene loci, and I mean, this is a really fantastic gene loci to begin with. So how do you see the field is moving, like in terms of what we understand to begin with, the temporal spatial regulation to today, the regulation, like, whether that sort of mimic or so what people understand in terms of the development? Yeah, the, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, the Hox gene uh, system is an interesting system in terms of epistemic value, that is uh -huh. the number of fundamental concepts that people have understood using this right. system, ever since Ed Lewis, in fact, in the 60s and 70s with the flies. Yep. And we've learned a lot, and um, the question, of course, is can we still use this epistemic system to go one step further now with this sort of new um, uh, developmental biology? And, and I think we can. I think the system will still be valid. For example, to look at um, the effect of the structure, the topology of the genome on gene regulation. This is a new field of yeah. research which has opened um, in the past uh, five years. Yeah. How, how does the, the, the structure of the genome influence gene regulation? And if it does, how does it change during development? What is the signals which are given not by genes acting in, in, in trends or in mm -hmm. CIS, but by the, the entire genome structure on gene regulation? This is the sort of question that we can still answer by using the Hox uh, gene system, I, I think. Yeah, because I think one of the things interesting for the Hox is that there are so many different kinds of regulation involved. There are in CIS, in trends, there are also link RNA involved, there are like um, different locals sort of like co collaborate together, and now there is this whole concept about the TAD um, structure. So how do you think those different layers of regulation was corroborating together or how we might be able to actually distinguish them in certain contexts? Like what do you see? Those yeah, that, that, that's an interesting um, uh, point in fact, because um, it, it is possible that this system allows to cross the boundaries between these different levels of regulation. Right. There is a classical cis acting regulation in the Hox system, yep. with very close by located enhancer uh, promoter. Yep. There is also very long range regulation. There is a cis effect, there are trans effects. So all these concepts that we have inherited from genetics over the past century, in fact, you can crystallize them around this Hox system. And I, I, I still believe that it's going to be very useful to study. I see. So I think one of the things you mentioned in your talk is that um, the whole development of the limb system seems to be one of the most sophisticatedly understand at this point. So what do you think it will sort of enlighten the other um, answered questions in the development? Yes, of the, the problem is that when, when you work in, develop, in developmental biology, you need to have material. Right. And embryos are notoriously small. Yes. And uh, you, you, you've got to work with the material you have. And the limb is, is special in this respect. Uh -huh. That is, you can get some kind of material, which is extremely difficult to get for the major body axis. You know, the gastrulation occurs yep. very early on in the embryo. It's virtually impossible to go them with the current tools of biochemistry and to make the right analysis. With the limb, it turned out to be possible. And this is why, in fact, um, knowledge on the limb system has been has, has went a little bit faster than knowledge on the trunk system. But I'm quite confident that by improving the biochemical tools, it's going to be feasible in the next five years to understand coordinarity in the trunk, the heart gene regulation in the trunk, 
to the level it is now understood in Williams. Would you expect that similar rules will be applied? Or? Well, um, I, I, I cannot imagine that the rules will be completely different uh -huh. because I think nature, as was said by uh, François Jacob, who actually was here in uh, 1985, I remember, as was said by François Jacob, we constantly reshuffle things, you know, in a way or another during evolution. So I would not expect the rules to be completely different. But on the other hand, it's clear that when the limb appeared in the course of evolution, some modification of the mechanics, you know, uh, occurred to, to, to be more appropriate for the limb. So I it see. might be di slightly different, but I think the basic mechanics will be, will be the same. I see. So going from sort of the overall developmental field, I think one of the things that you mentioned that one of the terms was used before is developmental genetics. And now it's more about developmental genomics. So do you think it's right. really just the technical sort of involvement or the technical advance or is more than that? No, it changed a lot. You know, words are very important in, uh -huh. in science and, and, um, and they, they are very telling on what is happening. And yep. it is true that in 30 years we moved from developmental biology, classical mm -hmm. stuff, you know, we were yep. cutting embryos in pieces and see what would happen, to a molecular developmental biology, yep. looking at how a gene, one gene, would behave in this. Yeah. And now we look at genomes. Now we look at the entire genome. How does it react when we do this? So it's right. developmental genomics. Yep. And this is something that started, I would say, five, six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a brand new field now right. opening, but very difficult field because again, to run biochemistry or genomics, yeah. you need material, and therefore we'll have to, you know, go down and down and down and down with the amount of material you can use. Yep before we can really apply this, this developmental genomics uh, discipline, which I think will be discipline for the next 20 years in developmental biology. I see. So do you think that um, in terms of the level of insights that can be get from this, now we call like developmental genomics, that do you think it's more in terms of the detail of what's happening in the temporal and spatial setting, or it's more of a different overview of what's happening in developmental? Processes. Well, I think when you start looking at uh, the genomes uh, instead of looking at genes, you immediately go into a level that is much more complex. So I would expect that we're not going to simply, you know, uh, find the little little details that we're still lacking. I'm absolutely convinced that we do not understand 95% of what is happening. And unlike what some of my colleagues think, that we, <laughs> you know, we've discovered everything and now, now it's just a matter of fixing a few details. No. Uh -huh. In fact, we only know a few details, and the problem is to really understand the basic mechanisms, the basic principles. I see. And I think that's the challenge for the next uh, 20 years. Sure. So, for your lab, or maybe even for the whole field, what do you think would be exactly as, as what you said, the, the, the biggest question that people need to tackle from here? Well, I, I mean, the, the biggest question for me would be to understand the genotype to phenotype transition, that is the coding system. How can we encode ourselves in our DNA? I okay, I mean, I can understand how the liver works, okay, how to make an enzyme and so on, but uh -huh. how can we encode in our DNA, in itself, the way to produce ourselves, okay, the development, how to make an embryo? This is a fantastic challenge. And I would, you know, dream of having a sort of mathematical equation. I mean, perhaps there's more than one. Perhaps there are two or three equations, you know, that, that would explain the problem. How to start with the genome and end up with, with you or me. It is something we don't understand. I see. And do you think, like, basically, like, there are people working on developmental questions in different model organisms and also now there are people always talking about how similar it is in terms of melanin yes. system and other systems. So how do you view this? Like yes, this, this is, I think, a, a, another fantastic uh, a, a new um, way of doing science for uh -huh. the past, I would say, 10 years, is that we now all work in the conceptual framework of evolution. And all the scientists you will meet here, if you talk to them, you will realize that eventually they integrate their thinking, they integrate the data within an evolutionary uh, framework. And the fact that we now have access to genomes, any kind of genomes, you can go into the harbor, you know, fish something and, and, and sequence it. I think that not only brings new data sets, but it also changes the, the mindset of people working in this field. Okay. 
let's let's have a comparative view. Mm -hmm. So it it brought back evolution into the game, much in the same way paleontology did that in you know in the, in the last century, where you, you would look at development in a comparative way. I see. So I think now that it's really a, a time that for the technical to booming, like with the technical advance about like CRISPR, like genome editing, and also all those very fancy and very interesting imaging technique, like. How do you see those in combination to really in line with developmental? Yeah, I, I, I tend to think that technologies do not really replace technologies. They add, they add to them. Yes. And when I see uh, the emergence of, for example, of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh -huh. approaches you mentioned, um, which, which are implemented in every laboratory now, in, yeah. including mine, uh, we see it as a way to bring mutation on the top of existing mutant alleles, I not see. to create things de novo, but you know, to, to add to the top of existing alleles. But altogether, it's true that uh, this new way to edit genomes, new way to see what is happening at the level of transcription, and so on. Mm -hmm. But the questions, they don't change. The basic questions, they don't change. So I think it's important to realize that new technologies mm -hmm. help to solve existing questions, but they rarely ask new questions. Yeah. It's technology, which is fantastic, I think, to develop technology. But we really must concentrate on the question and select the proper technology to answer the question. Yeah. No, I think it's really great. And I think when I talk to people, people also mention that it's really exciting to see the technical advance, but it's also always comes back it's to the heart of a scientist, what the technique can, can address, what kind of question Absolutely. that we now can and now I start to have um, people in my laboratory telling me, you know, why don't we CRISPR this and CRISPR that and CRISPR that? And, uh -huh. and, and it's great, it's fantastic. But then you have to tell them, what is the question? Why? Okay, what is the big thing you want to understand by doing this? I see. And if there is a big thing, then let's go, let's do it with these extraordinary technologies. I see. Well, it's great to hear you, you know, discuss all those big questions in the field. And I think it definitely will help a lot of the newcomers, new scientists and postdocs graduate student to think about those. Hopefully. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jane.